Hello and welcome to the Eastman's Predator Pros Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Nimnick, and I'm back. Still killing coyotes. I'm about uh, a month away from, from ending my season. I'm not going to lie. I'm starting to think about baseball a little bit. Um, starting to switch gears, but I'm not giving up yet. Still, like I said, probably have uh, about four weeks left. You know, I usually hunt coyotes through about that first week of March, just with all the different things I do. So uh, still killing them, you know. Right in the middle of breeding season right now, um, you know, can be a little discouraging this time of year. You know, obviously some of the coyotes out there have been pressured to some extent, makes them a little bit tougher to hunt. We all know that. I think a, a big factor that a lot of guys overlook on why coyote hunting does get a little challenging this time of year is because there's just a lot less coyotes. I mean, think about it. I mean, for the last four months, especially in areas where coyote hunting is popular, um, coyotes have been dying so you know there's only so many coyotes out there I, yeah and i know that coyotes fluctuate in and transient coyotes moving in there but it's never hardly ever going to replace it to the level it was back in in early fall so that alone makes it tough so you know like i always say man you just got to grind them out you got to find the right type of coyotes you know don't get so hung up this time of year on using breeding sounds i think a lot of guys gets hung up on that you know i i get more hung up on using coyote based sounds the coyote fights the pup distresses and i use those all year round but i use them even more so now um just because a lot of those coyotes are switching gears a little bit their aggression levels are changing especially the, the coyotes that are pairing up the the older male coyotes that are running around trying to find females in heat obviously their aggression levels are a little higher so um i key that so I'm covering ground this time of year. I'm not sitting longer. I'm almost sitting shorter. I'm covering grounds. I'm trying to find that particular coyote. So don't give up. You can really get into some cool stuff. I had the Lucky Duck guys out for uh, a couple of days. Um, I'll probably get them on the podcast here and talk about that hunt here coming up in a in an episode or two. Um, but it phenomenal. We killed 21 in two days. That daytime only hunting. We killed nine the first day and, and 12 the second day. But uh, pretty crazy, you know pairs triples stuff like that coming in it, it was pretty wild a couple days so you never know when those those banger days may be there so all you can do is keep grinding them out and hope that uh every now and then you hit them hit it cool like that where uh you know the coyotes are, are bombing in and and just everything's working perfectly but enough of that on to this podcast i'm gonna have a friend of mine named seth brown now seth he's the starting first baseman for the oakland days um met him recently Actually, through an Instagram message, believe it or not, um, you know, much like a lot of you listeners, you know, you guys send me messages from time to time. And Seth, you know, has been getting into coyote hunting over the last few years. Obviously, as a baseball player, he has the the off season is is winter time, which is prime coyote killing time. So um, he'd been getting into it, been struggling a little bit, been trying to to figure this out, you know, the best he can. And obviously, he can't go a lot, um, which you know doesn't help the situation when you're trying to learn, you know, the more you go, the faster you learn kind of a deal. But, um, so I had a couple conversations with him on the phone. I thought, you know what, it'd be awesome to have him on the podcast. He's in the boat of probably a lot of you guys listening, you know, that's been trying to kill coyotes here for the last three or four or five years, you know, maybe haven't seen the success that you're hoping for. So, you know, maybe he can give us some insight and we can talk through some things that, that he's experienced some challenge he's faced. And then obviously, you know, you know me, I love to talk baseball too. So, I'm sure we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. But before we jump into that, I need to thank uh, the, the sponsors of this episode, which are Swagger Bipods and Hornady. Now, uh, if you go over to Swagger's website, swaggerbipods.com, you can see um, the different line. And, and really, when you're talking about coyote hunting, we're probably looking at either the Hunter 42s or the QD 42s. And that's really your options, I think, um, when it comes to coyote hunting. The, the the 129s are probably going to be a little short. You're probably not going to like those, especially if you sit on any type of terrain, any sort of side hills, especially if you're a bigger guy, um, you're going to want to go with the, the 42s. Now, you know, I get a lot of questions on how those mount to the rifle. You know, it comes, if you have a rifle with a sling stud on it, you know, a traditional bolt gun, even if you have an AR on the rail up there, if there's a sling stud on it, some of the older style, style ARs had those. Um, there's a little attachment that'll hook right into that swivel stud and then the bipod just mounts right into that now if you're shooting an ar uh either with a picatinny rail or an m-lock rail you can buy a separate adapter for each of those um, and then that adapter will hook on to your m-lock or your picatinny and then bipod just hooks right into that with a couple couple little screws so 
pretty simple. So, you know, if you're looking for a new shooting system, maybe you want to try something a little bit different. Maybe you're wanting to be hands free. That's that's one of the main reasons I love the Swagger is it's hooked onto my rifle. I don't I'm not carrying a set of shooting sticks or a tripod or anything like that because obviously I'm crossing lots of fences, dragging lots of coyotes. Obviously, I have my call. I have other things I need to carry and do things like that. So I want hands free. So it's nice for me to just be able to hook that to my rifle and go. Um, but uh, but like I said, if you're in the market, head over to swaggerbipods.com. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you the promo code, which is Craze 25 all one word. Uh, use that the next time you're in that store, and that'll give you 25% off. Now with Hornady, talked a lot about the 53, 53 grain VMAX I shoot out of my, my AR, my 223. Um, but recently, I bought myself a wolf gun. Um, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be doing some some wolf hunting next fall, um, so I needed something bigger. It's gonna be up in Canada, so obviously I can't take my AR. So um, ended up buying me a six Creed more, um, and I've been shooting some of those 87 grain Vmax out of it. Um, and you know, actually I haven't killed a coyote with it yet. My boys have killed a handful of coyotes with it this year. Um, and Luke with Lucky Duck Crew, he used it this past week um, shooting coyotes. And I'll tell you, it's a hammer on coyotes. Sometimes it's not as fur friendly, but um, you know, it, I think it's going to be ideal for, uh, you know, maybe a 80, 90, 100, 110 pound wolf. I think, you know, and what reason I went ballistically, it shoots almost identical to, uh, the 53 grain 223 I'm shooting muzzle velocity wise, um, out of the barrels that I'm shooting in both those rifles. So I wanted something that would come right across, but, uh, lots of options there, but, uh, you know, it seems like some of those rifles are becoming more and more popular those mid range bullets, you know, in that 80, 90 grains, because guys can not only use them for coyotes, but they can switch over and use that same rifle for, you know, deer, antelope, stuff like that. So if you're in the market looking at uh, some new bullets, you can head over to hornady.com and see uh, everything they have to offer. Now onto the podcast. Well, Seth, appreciate you taking the time, man. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It's exciting. I'm a big follower. So I, uh, <laughs> Watch every video you come out with, man. I'm trying to learn. <laughs> Hopefully, not in the dugout, right? In between no, the innings, no, 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 no just in no, the off no, season. No. But in the locker room before games, I I'm studying. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like watching some coyotes get rolled up to to get y'all pumped up. Oh, fires me up before games, man. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I know you. I know you're getting ready here. What? Probably another week, and you'll be heading south. Yeah, another week, and then we're kicking off another year, man. Uh, see, there, yeah, I'm, I'm flying down on the 13th, so. I think camp originally pitchers and catchers go 13th. Uh, I'm going down about five days early just to kind of get used to the, the Arizona weather. And usually that first week is a big week of dehydration. So oh, yeah. I go down, I try and go down early when I can just to kind of get the body ready to go. That's a damn shame. You can't take all your calling gear with you down there. You can be right there in the, in the mix. I know. Arizona. Man, I've, heard I've heard you talk about it. That's best guy hunting around, man. Oh, so you know i think i mentioned um i kind of met another baseball guy anthony goss pitcher mm -hmm. for the guardians right just it's oh, kind of yeah. a weird deal he spends his winters out here in western nebraska wonderful hunting well anyway he was rehabbing in arizona all last all last summer and stuff from a tommy johns so yeah. he was like got into this coyote hunting thing and so i just sent him a few messages yeah go buy this he went and bought a lucky duck revolt and like he's just going out all he has is a shotgun with him because he's shooting duck or doves and pigeons off these uh, feedlots and stuff. And I said, "Perfect, yeah. you're you already got permission on the feedlot, man. You're ready so, to go." Yeah, he's been he's been trying to get after it. It's it's been fun kind of getting texts from him every now and then of uh, of him. And he's he's actually down there right now. I think I don't know if if the Guardians have if they're Arizona or Florida. I can't remember, but he's already down there already. Like yep. he's been they're in Arizona. Yeah. And yeah. So he's, it's funny. So I, so he played quite a few years in the big leagues as an outfielder. Yep. Um, and then I played against him while he was kind of learning how to pitch because he's got an absolute cannon. <laughs> so I, uh, I played against him when he was in Frisco, Texas and double a. Um, and then I think, uh, let's see, might've been last year, the year before we faced him at their place when he was up in the big leagues again, pitching. So, um, yeah, it's funny, you know, baseball world's a real small world. And, uh, I, you know, I know we've talked before and, um, he said that he talked to Anthony ghost and I was like, Oh my gosh, I know him. You know, it's crazy. You know, so it's funny how baseball world hunt world is it's, it, they can get small at times. So it's, uh, it's hilarious well, that uh, they go hand in hand. They're like perfect Mac. Oh match, man. man. In my opinion, you know, we can go hunt in the winter, play baseball in the spring, summer. You Absolutely. Know. That's uh, I mean, that's the best part. You know, you get, you get towards the end of the season and then, you know, your mind starts to, 
t- starts to look a little bit like, man, you know, hunting season's right around the corner. You're seeing all these new gear pop up and it's like, man, I can't, you know, party, party is, you know, you're obviously upset that season's over, want to keep playing, but the other party is like, man, I cannot wait to get back out there and, and start hunting again. So, um, but you're right. I mean, they match up perfect. I suppose if you're, if you're it's probably like first September and you know, you're out of contention to make the playoffs, is that kind of like, kind of like, yeah, yeah no. all right. How many more days? <laughs> it does we got? Sneak in there. I, like I, said, I spend my mornings being like, all right, what do I need for this year? Hunting? You know, like what, what, what stuff do I need to get? You know, I need to start getting everything dialed up. Yeah, no, it's uh, it does creep in, you know, it's, it's baseball such a long season now, you know, you got, uh, I mean, we start early February now and you go all the way till October and, you know, it used to be the guys, it, you know, it's spring training so long because back in the day, nobody would would really work out in the off season. So, you know, years ago, you'd show up to spring, guys are taking their first swings of the, you know, since the last season, guys are, you know, just no starting to get there. Oh yeah. So <laughs> now, nowadays, everybody start. I mean, most people take a couple of weeks to a month off of, of, of baseball stuff. You know, a lot of guys like me stay in the weight room uh, and keep your body going and doing recovery stuff. But I mean, by the, by, by, you know, usually most guys by December, January, I mean, they're, they're getting close to full go. And so when everybody shows up now, I mean, really most people, you know, they only need a, a couple of weeks of live at bats before they're ready to go. So by the end of spring training, you know, you're, two th- you're two weeks away from spring training being done and everybody's already like well <clears throat> i think we're ready for season you know so it's uh it's crazy how the game's kind of you know move in that direction of guys are starting to care for their bodies a lot more and starting to put in work a lot more in the off seasons than they used to yeah that's unique because i i almost see that filtering you know i do younger stuff younger kid baseball oh, yeah. stuff and i see it filtering all the way you know it's kind of unique yes. cause the 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 younger travel baseball scene you know has such changed so much compared to probably when you were playing i was you know all that kind of stuff and then you know it's it's interesting to hear that that same similar mentality is now all the way up you know top. so my nephews you know they play travel ball and i mean they they practice year round you know it's i mean and they're lucky because up here in the northwest i mean weather permitting them i mean they're a little bit a little bit more south than where i am but um you know the weather up here, it's so, it's so hard to battle. So a lot of people now are, you know, these, these indoor facilities are huge. And so, I mean, when I was a kid having a place like that would have been, you know, incredible. Um, and it's just, it's interesting, you know, to, to see how many kids are playing year round now, especially, you know, farther South you go, California, Arizona, it's, these kids are playing year round. So the talent level of, of baseball is just going up and up and up. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a huge debate about that. I mean, some like it, some hate it. I mean, mm-hmm. I always tell my parents, I said, bottom line, I mean, that's the way it is. That's the reality of it, right? Like Absolutely. Your, your kid compete is competing for, you know, scholarship spots on whatever college team. And that's the yeah. kids that he's competing against are the ones doing it all year. So if you're not, I mean. It makes it tough. It makes it, it makes it very tough. It's, I mean, the, the thing that I was sent for when I was a kid is, <clears throat> you know, my mom put me in everything possible. Uh, you know, I've done everything from swim team, racquetball lessons, tennis. I mean, I've done it all. And, you know, mainly I think my mom just trying to tire me out when I was a kid just to get us, you know, me and my little brother to go to bed. But, um, you know, it's what you're seeing a lot more nowadays. I think kids are are becoming one sport oriented, um, which is good, which is good and bad. You know, I, 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 I always tell kids, you know, do do every sport you can, especially growing up. You know, there's a certain age when you get, you know, getting into high school, it's like, okay maybe starting time to focus on what sport you're really trying to, to, to play at the next level with, you know, and um, it's one of those things where it, I I'm urging all kids I talk to make sure you're doing it all because it, it, it really does help with the development of your body, all that stuff. It, it's just, it's part of the deal. And, and when you become one sport oriented at such a young age, it makes it very hard to, to do anything else, you know? So, um, I, I, you know, anytime I go out, cause I, I do some stuff with my nephew's team and, uh, I help out a few camps around locally where I live. And, um, you know, I always preach two things, you know, make sure you're taking care of your grades. Um, you know, you're battling and I always let them know, you know, when you're growing up, you're, you're, you're in such a confined area, you know, for the most part, some kids are lucky that they play in a centralized area where you got kids coming from all the country to play at. But, uh, when you're from a small town like me, you know, you have to understand that, there are thousands of kids that want to do exactly what you want to do. And, uh, you know, learning how to, how to better yourself both in the classroom and athletically is just the, the, the number one and grades. It all starts with grades. And that's my two biggest things is do everything in grades. Oh, hundred percent. So growing up, you said you, you know, you did a lot of sports. 
what was your hunting background growing up? So my older brothers, you know, massive, massive hunters, you know, my earliest memories are watching them getting ready to leave, you know, getting dressed and, and getting ready to go hunting. And, uh, it's just something that's rubbed off on me. Um, you know, obviously playing and being as lucky as I am to do what I do for a living, you know, I haven't had the time, you know, early in the, in the last 10 years of my life have all been, you know, oriented towards baseball and that, you know, that was the number one. And, um, you know, it's only the last few, probably the last three to five years I've been able to start putting a little time into hunting again. Um, and what, I mean, so my oldest brother, he, he's actually did, he worked for Primos Outfitters or yeah, Primos for years, Turkey calling, all that stuff. And, uh, oh, did, wow. did some guy, yeah, did some guided yeah. stuff. And, um, so he's been, I mean, you know, it's funny. We talk about coyotes. I mean, with some of my earliest Turkey hunts with him, you know, we'd hear a coyote and he's able to, you know, with the Turkey call, um, he was able to call in coyotes just with it, you know, just with a Turkey call. So it's, uh, he was really, really, you know, experienced hunting and he's done it all. And, um, so watching them do all this stuff, you know, and, and, fit, and just being in the outdoors, my dad was big, like all we did growing up with my dad was fishing, you know, he's a big fisherman. And so having my older brothers being into hunting as well, just kind of gave me that, that, longing to be outside whether it was fishing whether it was hunting um and so it's it's just become kind of a a part of of what i do and and what i in my biggest hobby in the off seasons and this was all like in that central eastern oregon area is that yeah no Climber where? falls oregon growing that's yeah. that's born you know born and raised and um it's and like i said that the hunting in oregon it's uh it's not it's it's changing every year you know as far as rules regulations and and being able to get tags and so um, you know, trying to, to maintain and get out as much as I can with also having a little bit of limitation with time, because there's, there's only a certain few times, you know, cause I don't get to do a lot of scouting that I'd like to do in the summertime I'm gone. So, um, that's why, you know, I've, I've really picked up and, and tried to get, you know, more involved in the coyote and predator hunting, just because that's something you can do year, you know, year round pretty much. And, uh, it fits in perfect for me because, um, those times when I'm trying to plan a, you know, an elk hunt or a deer hunt, I don't get time to go out in the summer and scout and do all the things that, you know, really are going to help your success rates and your odds of, of doing, oh, yeah. of, of, you know, tagging out. And, uh, so <clears throat> for me, you know, I, I try and tell, you know, my, I try and tell my wife, you know, I want to do one big hunt a year, you know, and it's, it's kind of funny, you know, I come home and, you know, it's, it doesn't go over too well when I say, Hey, you know, I, I know I've been gone all summer, but I gotta, I gotta go for here another two weeks here. And so I, I try and tell her, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're started a family. And so I got kid, you know, a kid running around now. And, um, so it's, you know, my time's becoming less and less as, you know, oh, as yeah, I, uh, yeah. I get older here, but, um, yeah, I try and plan out as best I can one good elk hunter deer hunt a year. Nice. Well, see, so you do like I do. You get your kid just old enough, and then you, they can start coming on you with you. And then you got all the excuse. And hey, hun, yeah. son or daughter's it's, coming with me. You know, it's family. I gotta go. Yeah, this isn't. It's <laughs> not about me anymore. It's about the kids. We got to get them out. Yeah, I know, hundred percent. I I remember when my boys were young. I was like, they started go as as soon as they were potty trained. I said, you can start going coyote hunting with me. You know, and they're like two and a half, three. You know, we're hiking up and in and out of stands, and they, you know, so I was like piggyback rides most of the time with them, oh, and and I was like thinking to myself, oh, this just, I mean, it was cool, but it it sucked. I mean, it wasn't like the most fun ever because you're dealing with, you're, you know, oh yeah. And I was like, man, but it but it bought me time to go out and being able to hunt, um, you know, and and then now once those kids get older, it's like when they were eight, nine, they were like little veterans out there, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, you know and that's and, and looking back, those will be some of their best memories or hiking in and out of stands with dad you know yeah. and that's so it's it, it's also a you know a lot of people when they look at hunting you know they look at the aspect of like oh you know you're you're out there and you're you're killing animals you know but it's a, it's a lot more than that you know and oh, uh, any, sure. any 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 person that goes out hunting on a regular basis you know understands the fact that it, it's it's truly something that is is you know built for families to do you know and it's a it's a it's a skill set that you pass on and uh i can't imagine you know my life without being able to step outside and, and go hunting and go fishing, you know, and, um, it's like I said, you know, my earliest memories are watching my older brothers, you know, getting all dressed up in camo and thinking it was the coolest thing in the world, you know, watching them come back and, you know, and going out fishing with my dad. So, um, it's such a special time, you know, and being able to do it, you know, I feel like we're lucky to, to have the time to do it. Oh yeah. I know my middle son, he's a freshman right now. So he's into just getting into the high school sports stuff and, Mm -hmm. he's he's been pissed all winter because normally back in junior high the sports seasons aren't near as demanding right so he's just pissed because he's like he thinks he's missing out on all this honey i said hey man 
I said, you got to make a decision. If, if basketball is what you want to do, then, you know, then, or is it more important to hunt? I said, you have your whole life to hunt. I said, you know, missing out a few years on a few hunts isn't going to kill you right now, you know? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, when he sees you stacking them up the way you do out there, <laughs> I'd be pissed too. Have, <laughs> hey, have him come, have him come Kyle hunting with me a few times and he'll be like, Hey, let's go. Let's, let's, let's go back to sports for a little bit. <clears throat> well, that that's the problem. They've been spoiled so much. I said, you damn boys, you've been on nothing but guided coyote hunt your whole life. You haven't been paying attention very good. Cause you tried my oldest. Now he's like 17. So he can drive. He goes mm -hmm. out on his own and they scratch together one coyote maybe and it was a road dog or something like that you know not even a, a call in and i said man you guys haven't been paying attention but then but then they're like they've been spoiled you know they've been on all these massive coyote days before yeah but now they want it now duck and goose hunting's cool oh, them, and they want to go do all even though i've t taken them over the years to do that stuff you know i just don't care much for it but so that's what yeah. they want to do now that's what's cool so he thinks he's missing out more on that than probably so much the coyotes yeah, no, I got buddies that do that too. And, you know, obviously, I mean, Climate Falls where I'm from, it's, it's big, you know, and I didn't do, a, I didn't do a lot of that when I was growing up either. So, you know, it's, I'm just kind of starting to dabble in that and I'm finding that that's addicting as well, you know, so it's, it's just one vice after another. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, you remember your first coyote that you ever killed? You know, I do. And gosh, man, it, it, it's for me, like, one of the so the first one you know to me wasn't like it's a little hazy but the one that stands out the most is the one i killed on my own and it was i you know <laughs> i spend most of my time trying to find places i'm like all right you know this, if, I, if i was a coyote this is where i'd be you know <laughs> and uh, so i was driving around and i i walked into this clearing and it was probably four or five hundred yards off this blm road and i was like okay this is perfect and on my way in you know, I see this pair running and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, so I immediately, you know, dropped down into prone and, and, and shot the, I think I shot it. I think it was a male and walking up on it. It was like, holy cow, this is the coolest thing in the world, you know? And that for me, it was like, I was hooked. It was like, all right. Like, cause growing up, you know, we, my, the first time I really got involved shooting a lot, you know, my older brother, we, you know, we grew up a lot around ranchers and farmers and uh, they always have problem with ground squirrels, you know, so we'd go out with 22s and we'd shoot ground squirrels for hours, you know, and um, it, that's coyote hunting hadn't come really into my field of view and we didn't really spend much time doing it. And, um, and so there's only like these, like I said, the last like three to five years where really it's like, it's starting to get like become a thing for me where it's like, I want to spend, you know, at least a month out of my off seasons, taking, you know, trips out and trying to, trying to get a little bit better at it because I, you know, I used to think coyote hunt is something that you can do and, and they'll always be there and it's, Oh, Hey, you know, you get bored, let's go out and shoot some coyotes. And uh, I'm quick, <laughs> quickly understanding that it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's truly one of the, one of the hardest things to do um, it is to fool a predator, you know, with the senses, there's eyesight, all this stuff. And it's become somewhat of an obsession with me. I think the more I fail at it, the more I want to go back out the next day. Oh, yeah. That's your competitive nature right there. You 100%. know, like, and it makes yeah, it, and that's weird. It makes oh, it a lot more frustrating when I'm coming back in here and I'm like, all right, I got to, I, I got to get on here. I got, I got to go to the last stand and see what this guy's doing because this is ridiculous. You know, he's calling hey, you watch it. Hey man, we kill him on every stand. You see that, right? Like, yeah, yeah every, every stand you see, man, we're killing them, you know? <laughs> It's only the episodes don't show you the other ones that we never killed shit on. Well, you know? it's only the episodes where you're like, hey, you know, we've had these days where we this is our 12th stand. We're dry. And I'm like, man, yeah. I know exactly what that feels like. <laughs> That's my everyday right now. So uh, but it's you know, it's I think the other part is, is just where I'm at to, you know, getting into places where there's not a lot of traffic um, is, is is the biggest challenge out here. Yeah, that's that's. Um... Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and you mentioned it, the fact that, you know, you've done other types of hunting. And I think the hard part with coyote hunting guys getting into it is there's a, nothing really translates over. Like if no. you've hunted ducks and geese, nothing, trans, if you're a deer hunter, nothing really translates. It's like its own skill set, right? Like, oh yeah. And you can't just randomly say, like you said, oh, I'm going to go out once or twice a year. Yep. And yeah, if you have the right perfect spot, you know, I mean, at any given time, you know, you can push play on the remote and something might show up, but mm -hmm. to consistently do it, I think that's just like anything, right? Consistency is always the, the key part. Oh, you man. Know? 
Well, and I think I think what the the cool thing about what you do is, and, and I, I really grown to appreciate it, is is the time you put in. People people get to see the time you actually put into doing this, um, because I think, I mean, it's probably different everywhere, but you know where I'm at, coyote hunting is you know, it's like, Hey, you know, Hey, we're, we can't go hunting anymore. Let's go out and try and shoot some coyotes. But I think the way you do it and the way you go about it, it shows people that, Hey, this is a, it's a serious commitment and you, and you really have to have your stuff kind of dialed in in order to know exactly what to do and be successful on a regular basis. Um, you know, it's not like something you can just go out and, Hey, I'm bored today. Let's go shoot a couple of coyotes, you know, <laughs> as much as I wish it was like that. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's just not like that. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, that's a good way to put it, man. I mean, um, you know, you spend a lot of time doing something, just like all the time you dump into baseball, you know I mean? You couldn't, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's one of those things that the more time you spend, the more things you learn. Um, I've always tried to challenge myself traveling to new spots. I think that's what, that's what really separates guys. I think, you know, anybody can get good at hunting their spots that they've been hunting for a long time because they know exactly where they're going to drive in. They know exactly where they're going to sit. They know exactly where the coyotes usually come from. You know, I kind of call them what, like local experts, you know, guys that you might know around your country, you know, that you talk to that kill, oh, yeah. you know, but then really taking to that next step, something that always intrigued me, like, okay, how can I just randomly drive to someplace I've never been and kill coyotes that day, you know, never oh, have yeah. setting foot on it. To me, that's like, that's the challenge. Like, this is, this is awesome. If you can just show up anywhere and kill coyotes, that's to me, that's, oh, it's that's my favorite thing to do. That's amazing. You know, and, and like growing, like growing up, being you know being around hunting it's you know you go out and you know okay hey listen need to be downwind okay we're not going to be calling you know and there, there's certain things you know but it, it's so funny you know i go with my little brother uh once in a while and uh the first the first time we ever went out actually coyote hunting together to to be like hey we're going to go out and try and call in a coyote um was full five five years ago um you know and my my little brother he he's he's got uh, a lot more time to, to do the way that, you know, you need to hunt. So, I mean, he's, yeah. he's crazy. I mean, he hikes in, you know, eight, nine miles by himself Jeez. and does, does the back country stuff. And, you know, he scouts, you know, and so he really, you know, he's a hunter. And, um, so, I mean, I remember we were sitting there, you know, and, um, it, it's, it's funny the way these coyotes, you know, you just, they surprise you so often. And in my experience, and, yep. you know, <laughs> we ended up making a joke because, you know, we're calling into this, uh, it was, it was weird. We're calling into this little draw and we're expecting this coyote. We got, we got some vision out in front of us. We can see, you know, six, 700 yards. We're expecting, you know, like you see, you know, coyote sprinting across the field right at you, you know, and you get time. And, um, you know, I think I had, I had, I had an AR, he had a shotgun and sure enough, this coyote comes from downwind you know, 15 yards runs in front of us and stops and looks at us, you know, and it was enough for me to, it's like, wow, I did not, you know, I froze. Cause it was like, this is, this is crazy. Well, I mean, I did not expect this. And we both ended up missing this thing, you know, 15 yards, it takes off. And so we give each other a hard time. You know, my first thing was I, so my part, my first thought to say was like, wow, man, way to go. You missed it. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was hilarious. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 I think that's the challenge of it for me is I'm trying to get to the point now where, you know, I'm walking in and I have an idea of what these cats are going to do, but also understanding how these animals behave um, is something that I'm just kind of getting more and more addicted to is, is trying to perfect that, that, you know, when I walk in, I know exactly pretty much what every scenario could play out as. And it's, oh, it's 100%. a learning curve. And, you know, yeah. and, and like I said, I, I know I say it a lot, but I mean, watching your show has really helped me understand that a lot better because you do a great job of explaining what you're looking for, what they do, you know, how they react. Um, and so it's, it's just one of those things, man, where, um, you got to spend time doing it. It's, it's funny. You mentioned, you know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden stuff just happens so fast. I oh, mean, yeah. that's, you know, that's the weird, I've always thought about, you know, what, what has drawn me to coyote hunting, you know, and it's, and it's those, it, those small pieces of, I mean, you work your ass off for five, six hours and then for six seconds of like mass chaos and excitement, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, I, think, I mean, that's really what it is. It's not like, and I think those guys, the guys that are, I don't know, are t drawn towards coyote hunting. For some reason, there's that, I don't know if it's that grind, you know, in between there and then the, the reward at the end, it's not oh, like yeah. some hunting where it's just you know, dove hunting or I don't know, some waterfall where it's just constant kind of action for the action. most part, you know? Yep. 
you know, it's similar to baseball, really, if you think about it, right? It's like it baseball is. is like slow, slow. And then all of a sudden there's just these bursts of excitement throughout the, you know, the game. It's not like football where it's just con- basketball constant. Oh, you know, man. it's just a little different. I think there's cool parallels there. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I it, it's funny, the comparisons. You know, I do a lot of steelhead fishing now with my brother-in-law. And, uh, you know, we tie flies and we do it. You know, we we I fished with, you know, the gear and, and, and the beads and all that. But I've really kind of been drawn to steelhead fishing with a spay rod, you know, so fly fishing. And you're you're drifting a fly across, you know, underneath the water and you're hoping that a, a steelhead, which is a, you know, a fish that really isn't going up river to eat, it's going up yeah. river to reproduce. And, um, so these fish aren't hungry. They don't bite. They, they bite your fly cause they're mad at it, you know, and they don't want it out of their way. So you'll, you'll fish for, I mean, I've, I've fished. I mean, my, my brother-in-law had a dry spell where he didn't catch one for six months and we went yeah. almost, and he went almost every weekend. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're sitting there and on the 200th cast where you haven't caught anything, all of a sudden your, re, your line just takes off. And it's one of those things, I, it's very comparable to it because you're constantly going out hoping that something happens and you, you, you're expecting it to happen. It doesn't. And then all of a sudden it happens and it's just this rush of like, you know, holy crap, this is going down, you know. And uh, I think that's what the addicting part is, it, it, is you're, you're grinding for it and you're, you're, you're spending time hours and days going out going out and and trying to to figure out how to how to string those together and i you know i think one of my biggest goals is to string a day together where it's like every stand we got one coming in and i it seems that there's days when i go out there and it's it's the most frustrating thing in the world because um you know we got that those those sagebrush flats out here um and so you go out in the morning and you know you you hear them going and you hear one oh there's one you know maybe half a mile right over here and uh, you hear a couple over here, a couple over there, and then you get the call going. And it's for me, it's, I, you know, I'm still at the point where I'm learning how to string my calls together. And, um, you know, you hear all these call, all these coyotes talking, you know, right at first light and you throw on the call or nothing shows up and you're like, holy cow, you know, like, what am I doing wrong here? So it's a, it's a battle I'm facing right now. See, your, your quest is for the 1% clubs, what you're telling me, right? Yes, that is. You've heard me talk about that, right? See, that's that's like the holy grail. I always call that that because all those days when you grind and you grind for one or two or three times, Mm -hmm. you you know, you're just busting your ass all day long. And and then every so often you hit a day where you're doing everything right, like you normally do, but there's just the coyotes are there for whatever reason, just they're just they're turned on more. Yeah. You know, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is. You're just in the right spot, you know, more than likely mm-hmm. that's probably what it is, but God, it's just and then those magic. days, and then you're like, damn, yeah, this is, and then you go for who knows how long, you know, yeah. before you have a chance to that again. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, and that's, that's one of those things where it's, it's, I live in an area where that can definitely happen. And so, you know, it's just getting into that, that zone and getting into that, you know, their little bubble, as you like to call it and, and stringing it together. And so, um, yeah, been, been really busting it this year, trying to make it happen. Well, and you mentioned something that's pretty frustrating, and I think a lot of guys see this, you know, it's almost like they think that there should be a sound or something that you should play that should work every time, you know, and unfortunately, it's not that case. I mean, coyotes, first off, every coyote's different, you know, Mm -hmm. every coyote has a different level of aggression, I think. Just, you know, you take a litter of of dog puppies, you know, black lab pups or hunting dog, whatever you have, there's Mm -hmm. just, you know, from top to bottom in that litter, there's just different styles of coyotes in there you know and Absolutely. different types of coyote or different types of dogs or puppies in there but and i think that relates exactly to coyotes so you know you've heard me talk about probabilities and percentages and just it's that's really what it is unfortunately it's like okay how can i put myself in the best possible situation here that if there is this coyote that that we can mm-hmm. call in you know will it come and and then can we get it killed and yeah and then it's just you know grinding it out all day to to, to make that happen <laughs> Well, the biggest, I think the biggest challenge I'm facing with it too, is I find myself, you know, it's like you said, you know, when you go out and, and you're in, especially BOM, you know, you don't know how many times these, these dogs have been called to, you yep. don't know if they, you know, how many times they've been shot at. Um, so you're trying to find something different. And that's, that's kind of what I've been trying to do is, is find something different that, you know, nobody goes out there and just puts on rabbit. Um, you know, I've been trying to change it up and, um, you know, you talk a lot about the coyote vocals and, uh, and all that. And, uh, for me, it's, I, <laughs> I battle it nonstop because I, I make these calls and, you know, whether I'm putting on a field mouse, you know, or, or a bird sound, something different. And I always find myself back at the rabbit call 
And I'm like, what am I thinking here, man? Like, like, why do I go back to this? You know, and I, I end up calling for what I sent, what I, you know, what I big, my biggest problem is like, I think about it, you know, if I was a coyote, this is the sound I'd want to hear. To, oh to yeah. Come yeah. Running through, you know? And uh, I think that, so having, I think understanding like, you know, every stand is going to be different. And it's like, you talk about when, when, when there's a different, when you have a litter of pups, you know, every personality is going to be different. And, and, understanding that when I'm walking out in and I, and I do a 20 minute set um, that I think the biggest fear that I chase is, okay, I got to cover all these sounds because, you know, I'll feel like I didn't call the right ones. So I'm running through all these different sounds. And um, it's, it's, it's just like you said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm starting to get better at when I leave, you know, you said something on one of your shows that there, there may just not be a coyote there. And um and that's been helping me a lot, just being like, hey, listen, you know, there may not be a coyote in, in hearing distance and it's OK. You know, let's keep going. Let's let's keep grinding. And, uh, you know, that, that's why I said I've learned a lot from your show just by watching, because back, you know, like, even last year, I'd sit there and I'd be doing, you know, a 30 minute call session or a 35 minute call session. Because I'm sitting there I'm like, I hoping here. <laughs> it's like, I know they're here. But I just got to play that right sound. And uh, so it's 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 been a, it's there's definitely a learning curve that I'm facing. Yeah, that. You know, it's really control what you have control over, right? It's like it's no different than if we were talking baseball, right? That's huge mm -hmm. in baseball, right? Control yeah. what you have control over. You can't be thinking about whatever else. Just, you know, coyote hunting is no different. I mean, that's what I try to explain is control what we can control, right? We can't control yeah. what type of coyotes there. We can't even really control if there's even a coyote out there in the first place. Yeah. You know, but once we set down, I mean, we have control over how we get in there, how we set up, the spot we're setting up in. Um mm -hmm. Do we have all the avenues covered? Um, did I roll through, you know, a sound sequence that covered the different triggers and things, you know, when we're talking about mm -hmm. potentially calling maybe these more aggressive coyotes or, you know, these little pussy coyotes, you know, that aren't yeah. going to come anyway, no matter what sound we play. Cause that's, mm -hmm. we know that's the case. There are some of those out there or some people might call them educated or pressured or to whatever yep. extent. So I'm like, you know, control, you control. And that, that is, you know, let's just cover ground, you know, <laughs> crank out these stands, do them right. When a coyote does show up, we're going to kill it, you know? Yep. Make sure your kill percentages are crazy high. I mean, that's one thing I think a lot of people don't see. What we do is, you know, kill percentages are way high, meaning the coyotes we call in, very, very few of them get out of there. And that's just more yeah. of the setups and being good shots and things like that. But, you know, you might only get, it might be a day where you might only get two opportunities, three opportunities in a whole day of hunting, and you don't want to screw both, you know, those up. So, absolutely you know control like, you control 100 percent. and you know i had actually a couple weeks back um there i had one there it was so interesting to me and, and I'll, I'm, I'm trying to I, i'm honestly i've been writing some stuff down just on stuff that i'm seeing uh that's helped me a lot um you know i just got done with this set uh nothing came in um you know and i and I, i'm <laughs> i'm driving out of there going i'm never coming back here it's ridiculous you know and i'm, I'm mad whatever and um, all of a sudden I see Kyle across the road. I'm telling you 200, 200 yards in front of me as I'm driving. And, um, you know what? I, and I was like, and how far, were, how far were you from your last stand? How, how far did you drove? Oh, man, not that prop. I'd say probably, I'd say a quarter of a mile, probably. Oh, so not very far. All right. Not very far. I, I mean, if this thing, I mean, I guarantee you that Kyle heard my set. And, yeah. and I, and, and it could have been one of those things where too, where maybe I didn't call long enough, you know, I can't remember. I, I know it wasn't, you know, a 20 minute or, you know, may have only been a 15 minute set, but I like, as I'm driving, this thing looks at me as I'm driving my truck and crosses the road and <laughs> where I was at that day, there was some, there's a lot of juniper trees up here. Um, and so it goes into the juniper trees, you know, it's a little thick area. And I was like, you know what, whatever I'm going to grab, I grab my hand call and I jump out of the, tr I pull over. <laughs> jump out of the truck, you know, and I run probably 30 yards, 40 yards. And I just start cranking on this hand call. And sure enough, this thing's sprinting right at me after seeing the truck. And so it just, it, it just kind of, it just goes to show you that, you know, these, you really just have to be at the right place at the right time. And if you play the right sound, it really doesn't matter. And it's just about finding that sound. Yeah. You know, that's, that scenario right there is really, that's my whole mentality of calling coyotes, right? Like, you know, you made a stand quarter, half mile away from this coyote. Mm -hmm. No doubt he heard it, right? Especially if you're yep. putting volume out there on the call and oh yeah, hands down, he heard it. 
you know, it's just, I talk about the bubble, like of the, you know, the bubble size of these coyotes, like some coyotes, some days their bubbles are big, meaning they're running from a long ways coming mm -hmm. to lots of sounds. Other days, it's just like they're locked down tight. Like you have to be right on top of them to call them in. And that's like a prime example. Like that coyote was not in a big hurry to probably come running a half mile to where you were calling. But then mm -hmm. right then, even after he just saw your vehicle, obviously he wasn't threatened. It wasn't like this coyote was running for its life after he saw your truck. He just went back into there and you blew nothing but a rabbit <laughs> in yep. the stress. And the yep. coyote is like bombing in quick right on you. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, and it was, and it was quick. I mean, I, by the time I had jumped out of the truck, pulled over, uh, you know, got my setup, grabbed my AR, ran in there. I mean, we're talking maybe, maybe two minutes and yeah. I sit down to crank it. And within a minute, sure enough, I see this thing just bombing in right at me from 200 <laughs> yards away, you know, and uh, it's just, it's just so funny how these things, and, and it's, I think that's, that's the biggest thing I battle is, is, is finding places where, you know, everything is, is not everybody's out there calling, you know, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people miss too, is, you know, when you, when you're driving out and you're, and you're looking to call, you know, and you look at a spot, let's say it's a, you know, driving on the road, you see a spot on Onyx, whatever, and it's maybe 200 yards off the road. Everybody that's been out coyote hunting on that road has seen that same spot and has said the same oh, thing. Yeah. Like, wow, that's perfect is little hill or tree to hide the yeah, truck. That, right that behind, spot right? is perfect. Yeah. We'll have great cover. And, and so yeah. I think that's the thing that is kind of the next step for me it is really putting in the time uh, on Onyx, Onyx, especially, you know, cause obviously yeah. for me, I got it to get out to a spot where I know that these, that these coyotes haven't been called to, you know, very often, if at all, uh, you know, I got to drive a couple hours, you know? And so it's, it's really putting in the time for me of, scout, of getting on Onyx and, and doing my homework on areas and not just driving out and going like, well, this looks like a good spot, you know? And um, I think that's a lot of things people miss too, is, is, is there's definitely a homework you have to do on where you go. Um, you know, not there's, sure you know if there's places where you can get access and you know you have these ranchers that, that don't want them you know their calving season whatever it is um you know a lot of guys like you know like me that you know look for the blm and it's you got to understand that there's a lot of people that also go out there too and so when you're driving you're looking around it's like man that place looks great and everybody else that's been out there yeah. within the past three weeks has also looked at that spot and said wow that, that spot does look good well i can tell you this if more people focused on their location, their, their spots and finding, uh, you know, you know, ki you know, I kill over 300 coyotes a year, travel all over the place. I mean, I make thousands of stands all over the place, right? Like oh, yeah. access all just oh, yeah. this, this constant, you know, challenge of continually building up access and learning new areas. And right. Because it takes a massive amount of land to kill a lot of coyotes. I mean, absolutely. You know, so, but, but I think a lot of coyote hunters totally overlook that. They're more worried about the type of sound that they should play. I can tell you this. Most of the coyotes you call in, especially the ones that show up in the first like two to five minutes, six minutes, you could have probably played any sound on that e-call and they probably would have showed up. 100%. You know, granted, I think there are coyotes that are kind of on the edge where they're kind of hanging up out there and we got to maybe play a different type of sound that triggers a little bit different response and you get those coyotes to come. But Generally speaking, I bet you if I just had to put I'm going to put a number. On, I'm going to say probably 70 percent of the coyotes that coyote hunters kill. It wouldn't have mattered what they play. And here's the thing about it. You could debate this all day. Right. Because we'll never know. I mean, yeah, we can't 100%. ever recreate that scenario and say, OK, let's recreate this scenario and let's play this yeah. sound instead. Right. It's like my theory versus yours. So 100%, I, no, I just feel that way. Like those coyotes that in, in what's what's the common denominator right there. Right. We were set up. What? right in the right where close proximity of the coyote and so yeah. that's that's what i base my whole theory on of yeah can we sit there 30 40 minutes and play all these different sounds and hope that this slow sneaky coyote finally shows up and we get a shot at it well sure you can you know but odds and, and probabilities tell me that your odds of doing that aren't very good absolutely probability and odds tell us hey if i cover a massive amount of ground today and a massive amount of area there are these coyotes out there that will come to the call today no matter how pressured you think they are what it might be but you know we just got to make stands where we can get in close and 
And if the coyotes are coming from close, guess what? I ain't sitting there forever, right? Yeah, 100%. Like you said, if they're within they're within that close bubble, they're usually on us in the two to four minutes. So it doesn't mean I'm making four minute stands, but I'm not making 20 minute stands either because at the end of the day, that all adds up, you know. And if you're saving 15 minutes a stand after you've made 10 stands that day, you've already saved what two and a half hours. Well, now you've Absolutely. made that many more stands and covered that much more ground at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, it, I think the thing that, that frustrates me the most is, you know, when I'm, when I'm going out and, you know, I'm walking around and looking for spots, it's, I know they're there because I'm seeing tracks. I'm seeing, I mean, I, there's times when I walk out and I'm like, holy crap, you know, there's gotta be, it looks like there's 30 coyotes out here. I mean, this is ridiculous, you know, and then you sit yeah. down you make, and you make a call, nothing comes in. Um, you know, so I do think you're right when it comes to getting in and covering ground and, and getting within those, those bubbles that those coyotes, and, and it's like you said, I mean, there's coyotes that'll come bombing in from, you know, half a mile out. And, uh, then there's coyotes that'll come out and sit 600 yards and just wait. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's been fun to try and, and, and master, you know, and, and master, I mean, putting together a good set too is another one for me is like trying to master. Okay. I've got the ability here within the, with this, let's say a 20 mile stretch on a BLM road, be like, okay, I have the ability to, to, to make, let's say 15 sets in that 20 miles, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I get in a bad habit of, of driving out, finding a spot on Onyx being like, wow, that spot's going to be perfect. Making what getting out there, realizing, okay, I can only make one set at this spot. I just drove out here, whatever it is, an hour and a half. And I can only make this one set because yeah. I didn't really look at it and be like, all right, how many more can I do after that? You know, cause my mind is, I get so one track mind. It's like, okay, if there's coyotes, they're going to be in that spot. And, um, you know, the coyotes are where they are. And, you know, no matter how bad a spot looks, uh, you just never know. And so just having the ability and willing to go out there and say, okay, hey, listen, that does not look good at all. But you know what? Let's go, We're gonna let's call go it. give it a word. Let's go, let's go over there and call it, see what happens. Um, and I think that's, you know, you get so wrapped up and looking for that perfect spot when yep. really it does, it's it's not about the spot. It's about, I mean, it's about being where the coyotes are. Yep. And that's a great um, point. I think a ton of guys are like that. They 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 drive, and if it's not perfect. They're like, no, let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. And to me, you know, you're passing up ground. If you want to talk about perfect bombing an area, I mean, that's what essentially when I'm, when you're talking about, you have a road, you know, anytime I've ever been out in that BLM country, whether it's Wyoming or Idaho, Eastern mm -hmm. Oregon, Arizona, you name it, you know, that's usually what you end up doing. You know, you have this massive amount of area that you can hunt. Well, how, some of it looks different. Some of it will look the same. And you're like, where do you even start? Right. Yeah. A lot of times I'm like, let's just start here. The wind's good. You know, let's, let's just start carpet bombing this area. And then after, you know, after you carpet bomb it with four or five, six stands over a couple hours, you might get a, you start building an idea of what, what's happening. Okay. Have I had a couple of coyotes that have came bombing in, you know, have I had a coyote or two that's been real sneaky and just sneaking through and you've got glimpses, you know, and then mm -hmm. that kind of leads you on towards your plan for the rest of that trip, kind of yep. how you want to attack it. But, but yeah, I don't, some stands obviously you get to and you're like, oh yeah, this looks really good. Perfect. Oh, but yeah. then other times you're like, damn man, this, this does not, <laughs> and your expectations are pretty, which is probably better because those really good stands, your expectations are so high and then nothing oh. shows up and you're even more depressed, but those shitty spots, it's like, oh, you know, and then when you're, then it's like, oh, awesome. Something showed up. Well, I get spoiled too. Cause like I said, I, I watch your show pretty religiously, you know, and I've seen most episodes at least twice and <laughs> you know, I'm out there looking, I'm like, wow look what he's hunting and look what I have to deal with here. I mean, this, that looks fantastic. So I get yeah, so yeah. caught up sometimes driving out, looking <laughs> for a spot. I'm like, man, I get, I got to make it look similar to what, to what Jeff was doing because that, I mean, he's, he's a killer out there. So I got to make it look similar. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, I, I think you, you really have, like you said, every place is different, whether it's Arizona, Wyoming, I don't know. So you have to figure out exactly what these coyotes do in the area you're in. And, yep. you know, coyotes are, are, are are, are funny and i mean they're they're literally they're everywhere and then there's spots where they're not and yep. understanding what these coyotes do and wherever you live i think is a big i mean just the more you can understand about what these coyotes do um it is just kind of kind of the cherry on top that is going to push you over that edge of whether you go out and are successful or not and well, it's uh, all about cover it's all about cover yes. right i mean coyotes coyotes are going to use that cover whether it's in your country whether it's sagebrush and junipers mm -hmm. you know 
you, you've seen the last stand episodes when we're filming in the sand hills in Nebraska, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have sagebrush and junipers, but we have choppy hills, which is cover, right? Any sort of little dip terrain, whether it's a little cut, a little canyon, there, you know, there's tall, you know, rush beds, you know, tails down on the ponds when they get frozen up, that's cover. You know, you mm-hmm. go south into Arizona and it's it's like washes with the thicker vegetation down in the washes, you know. That's just oh, where yes. the cover's at. You go east and it's creek bottoms and you know, sloughs and CRP fields and stuff like that. That's cover. So I think that's that's really it is is being able to set aside exactly what your cover looks like where you're at. And especially if you're watching videos, it oh, looks yeah. different. But just understanding that cover is where it's at. I mean, I have to set up to where there's plenty of cover within a, you know, five, 600 yard radius, because that's where the coyotes are going to be. And the more that cover, the more the odds go up that, Hey, there's a coyote in here. That's might come to the call. Yeah, absolutely. I think. And the other thing that's, that's also, I mean, I travel quite a bit, um, you know, so the wife and I were traveling, you know, a lot of weekends in my off season. So I've started to, to bring my stuff with me wherever I go. And yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's because I mean, there's so many times when I'm, I'd be, you know, I'd be driving. I'm like, man, that looks, I got, I got, you know, 20 minutes to spare here on this <laughs> ride, you know, just, you know, I can run out for 20 minutes. And I think, yeah. I think just having my stuff with me and being able to be like, Hey, let me pull over here for a minute and just check this out. Um, you know, it's, it, it's one of those things where I don't, you know, in the midst of my baseball training and all this stuff, um, you know, I'd like to be able to go out a couple of times a week, you know, every week. Um, and it's, it's, I don't get that opportunity a lot, you know, yep. unless it's early in the off season, you know, in that early October. And, um, it's, so I got to pick and choose my times of going out. Um, you know, and we're up here, you know, the weather plays a big role. You know, it's, it's funny. I got into a, we had, so last time I went, which was two, two weeks ago, maybe, uh, we had uh, a real cold snap come through. I mean, it was negative, negative five. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. The whole one went here. through the whole country. Yeah. And, uh, my brother-in-law, we decided to go out and, uh, in my truck and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're way out there. You know, we had, dr- we, we drove two hours and then took this BLM road, you know, 15, 16 miles up in here. And the only thing you're dealing with up there is there's a couple big branches and other than that, it's BLM. And so we were lucky enough at the time where we drove out and we had just passed this little, this little home. And we were like, oh, okay, well, the, family here let's keep going looks like there's a little farmhouse whatever here um you know we get two miles up the road and i've been out there a couple times you know scout whatever just having you know whether i'm just out there cow hunting or just driving around and um this road i turned onto turned out to be a giant just frozen over puddle and my truck had sunk deep <laughs> deep into it and we we and i mean at that de- at that day we had quite a you know big blizzard going on we had made a couple sets beforehand and it was in between this you know wide out blizzard and so anytime we had a moment of uh, you know, where the snow would stop a little bit, we'd go make a set. And uh, turned out we spent the better half of the morning uh, trying to dig out my truck. And we ended up having to hike in a blizzard two and a half miles back to that farmhouse, hoping somebody could pull us out. Luckily, um, <clears throat> luckily there was. And I was surprised, you know, because I, I drive a tundra and I was like, man, these things never get stuck out here. So it's like I'm doing, I'm just battling one thing after another. And, uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's like I said, I, I spent the more time you can spend out there and the more, the more sets you can make, the better chance you have. Hey, if you're not risk getting stuck, then you're not going in deep enough. That's what I always say. Right. A hundred percent. I absolutely. And I, I was surprised because these tundras, I was like, man, I'm invincible in this tundra. I mean, I never got hey, yeah. this when I, I mean when we got out and I felt it, I was, I told my brother, I say, Tommy, we're, we ain't getting out of this. Like we're, we're, I'm, we're going to have to hike this back and hope somebody's home and uh, no service, of course, you know, oh, and, yeah. uh, but that's just all part of the, the fun of it, you know? And um, so it's like, I, you know, I, I'm, it seems like everything's against me out here. You know, I, I get, I get a day and I'm like, Hey, let's go. I'm going to go out coyote hunting today, you know, and then I got to spend, you know, three or four hours trying to get unstuck. So um, it's just all part of the fun for me. Yeah, the old tundras, you know, that's my running joke with all me and my buddies in my tundra. Like, they usually ask how many shovels do I have in the truck when we leave yeah. when it's snow, you know. And yeah. I, I did bury it in a water hole one time. And, I, yeah, you're so screwed in something like that because you're not getting out. You can't. Yeah, it's like you just – I can sit there and dig a drift out. Give me 30, 40 minutes, and I'll dig that baby out. But, yeah, mud hole, water hole, yeah, you're done. Yeah. But it's always something out there. And, uh, but I will say, you know, and I've said, I already said it earlier in this podcast is, um, you know, having a guy like you who's willing to, cause this is, this is something that I think is, is important not only for, 
you know, hunters that want to get into something that can do it all the time. But, you know, also we, you know, deer populations here in Oregon, especially have really kind of started to, to take a hit, you know? And so um, it's one of those things for me where understanding and going out and actually, you know, putting effort towards, you know, helping the deer populations, especially in my area, um, you know, having a guy like you who spends the time to kind of educate people on how to, on how to do this stuff is, is, is very important, you know, and it's, and it's also something that it's like when you bring your kids out, it's something you can introduce to your kids at an early age, because where I'm at, you know, if you want to be successful hunting, you got to hike. And it's not like you can take an eight or nine year old kid out there, strap 50 pounds on his back and say, Hey, let's, we're going to hike, you know, eight miles up over this ridge here. And we're going to camp for three days. And, um, so doing stuff like this is important, you know, and it's also a great way to introduce your kids. I mean, if that's something you want to do is, you know, introduce your kids to hunting. It's just a great, it's a great experience for everybody. Well, you talked about it, you know, you're traveling quite a ways to go coyote hunting. I think a lot of people might be listening to like, damn, you drive two hours to go coyote hunting. Hell, I only have to go, you know, and, and I'm no different, you know, where I'm at. Could I go hunt coyotes 20 minutes from my house? Yeah. I mean, do I have a few spots that are that close? Yeah. But it seems like the more the better spots I have are farther out, just away from civilization. You know, I mean, you just do simple math, right? You, you draw a circle with a 50 mile radius on it, right? Yep. Do your, uh, we all learned the, what the IR squared, you know, yep. what's that? Yeah. So you're looking at what, like, um, what would that be 50? So you're looking at like 7,500 square miles of area that you could potentially hunt in, in a 50, go, only going out 50 miles from your, from your house. Just double that now to a hundred miles. Now, if you're willing to drive a hundred miles from your house, now you have what, like 30, 31,000 square miles. So you've, oh yeah, the amount of area that you potentially could hunt in now has quadrupled by only Absolutely. going twice as far. So, so yeah, I think that's a huge part of it, you know, and then you start drawing population centers, right? If you wanted to pull out the map and say, okay, where's the bulk of the guys coming from that are coyote hunting these areas? And draw like a 50 mile radius around all those, you know, and then all of a sudden start, you start looking in the areas where, okay, maybe those radi those radiuses don't overlap. And you're like, okay, maybe these are potential spots that, you know, I can get to that maybe haven't seen a lot of pressure. You know, I'm going to get into some coyotes that haven't really heard a call yet this year. And, um, yeah. Cause that's, we don't want to talk about 1% days. I mean, you ain't killing 10 coyotes on, uh, you know, hammered pressure. Let's be, let's be real about that. Right. It's usually like locked down. Like probably nobody's called it that year. If maybe once, if you're lucky and it's, you know, the coyotes just come running into rabbit in about three minutes. And that's what you're, and that's what I'm out there chasing. You know, and, yeah, and it's yeah. funny when, when I first started, um, you know, three years ago, whatever it was, um, you know, out where I'm at, you can go, you can drive about 30, 40 minutes and be into some BLM and in and, and some areas where you're like, there'd be nobody out here. You know, this is, why would anybody come out here? Yeah, you know, type yeah. of thing. Whether you're, I mean, shed hunting's big, but if you're at that time of year, there's nobody out here shed hunting. So why would anybody be out here? I mean, I've had stands where I've hiked out and been like, man, I, I, I drove 30 minutes up this off the BLM road on another dirt road. So I'm back in here. Shouldn't be anybody back here. You know, I'll go out and make a set. Nothing will come in. I'll, be packing my truck up and I'll have two people on a, on bicycles drive by uh, out here, you know, like bicycling and they're mountain biking. And I'm like, Hey, you know, yeah, sorry. I'm not just out here trying to shoot a coyote. So um, it's something that I found out early. It was like, listen, I, I mean, I can go to these places and yes, are there coyotes? Absolutely. And could one come in? Absolutely. But if you're trying to do it consist consistently and, you know, I'm trying to be away from people as, as much as possible because uh, you know, anything, if you're going to spend time doing it, you might as well try and become, like you say, one of those 1% guys where it's like, you, you know, you don't know very many people that can go out and, and kill nine coyotes in a day, you know? And, um, it's just one of those things that you have to, I mean, depending on where you're at, you're going to have to battle it. And for me, you know, I battle that because, you know, central Oregon is known for its rock climbing, hiking, mountain biking, you know, there's thousands of miles, uh, combined throughout central Oregon just in my area of mountain bike trails. So, you know, you think you're out there by yourself and you just don't know what kind of traffic this has seen, you know, and, and how many people have really come out here on their, on their mountain bikes, just out for a, a day mountain bike, you know? So um, it's like you said, you have to draw those circles around those populated areas uh, and really look at it consistently and be like, Hey, there, there probably has been quite a few people running around out here. And so I have to, where I'm at, I have to drive that far just to be able to make sure it's like, okay, I know nobody in their right mind, unless they're training for an ultra marathon are going to be out here. 
Like this is this is out here. This is desolate. We don't got any service, so nobody's coming out here. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's here's another thing to consider when we're talking about pressured coyotes and trying to find areas where maybe nobody's been is coyotes are getting killed off, right? I mean, this this is probably, and I think about this a lot, you know, because for me, I I think the term educated pressure coyotes gets thrown around very loosely. I think us as hunters, we're always needing some sort of excuse when when shit yes. don't happen, right? It's like, oh, well, that coyote's just, you know, not, it's got to be that, you know, not our fault kind of a deal, right? But if you really think about it, you know, there's only so many coyotes, right? Like, we mm-hmm. don't, we don't, it's not, they're not like hogs where they're reproducing twice a year, whatever. I mean, we get one crop of coyotes a year. Yes. Are there, are there transient coyotes that will move around and fill in the areas? Yes. But that's only if like the, the carrying capacity is extremely, you know, high in, in an area around and there's an excess of coyotes. Right. But if there's not, then it, I didn't think it's unrealistic to think that you're just going to all of a sudden have all these new coyotes move in just because you killed off a few coyotes. So as the season progresses, even if only one or two guys have maybe hunted that area, you've, you're going back to hunt and they killed off four or five, six coyotes. Those were probably the four, five, six coyotes that were the aggressive ones. Absolutely. If we go back to my general, my, my beginning theory, I was kind of talking about, right? Like we're calling in the, the more aggressive coyotes, right? And that's our tactic. Well, so now there's just less coyotes and the ones they did kill off a majority of them were these aggressive ones. So is is it getting harder to hunt coyotes towards you know that middle to end part of the season because they're all pressured, or is it because there's just a lot less of these of the aggressive ones that are the ones that normally come running into the call? I mean, it's, it's up for debate. Obviously, we'll never know, but something to think about. I think about it all the time. You know, you're driving by and you, and you see these areas that are right next to a ranch or right next to farmers that you know they don't want these coyotes on their property, and you're you know you're talking about boundary lines and finding places where you think okay, hey, but the thing that crosses my mind all the time is if, you know, if I'm a rancher and I've got, and I, you know, and I've got cattle, I'm going to do everything I can to try and make sure that nothing's going to bother them. So I, it crosses my mind all the time of, okay, you know, these coyotes, they're here. I know they're here. I've seen them, see tracks, whatever, you know, how, how willing are they to come into a call? Because how many times has this rancher seen them running out in this field, taking a couple of shots at them? You know, it's, um, it's just something that it's, 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 it's unknowable. You know, yeah. you don't know. And the only way you're going to find out is getting out there. And I think that's that's where a lot of, of coyote hunters get discouraged is you could be in a rut like like me and go out there your last three times you've gone, spent all day, haven't called in a single coyote, seen them on the way home, even when you're driving home and you see one out in the field and you're just like, man, you know, like what <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> and uh, but it's it, it, I think the the biggest thing that I that I you know would urge people to do too is you know, study up and, and ask, you know, don't be too proud of a, of a guy to be like, Hey, I I'm not very good at this, especially a guy like me who, you know, I do everything I possibly can to be a good hunter and having the ability to say, Hey, you know what? I, I I'm going to, I'm going to reach out and ask for some help here. I'm going to do a little studying because it's, you know, hunting is a pride thing. You know, you, you want to go out and you're like, oh, I don't need any help from anybody. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I, I'm a killer. You know, I do all this. And, um, me, I got no shame. You know, I'll, I'll say, man, I, I stink at this and uh, I can't call in a, a coyote to save my life right now. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, been a big, a big thing for me that's helped, too, is, 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 you know, calling you, asking you questions, picking a guy's brain who does it every year and is successful doing it. Now I'm all about reaching out, you know, Instagram, whatever that is. I get obviously tons of, but don't send me a, 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 a one sentence question that says what sounds working right now. Right. Like to me, that's like, that's lazy. And it's, and it's not the case. Like there's probably way more things that are screwing you over than the sound that you're playing. Right. Like I think a lot of guys think they can, I don't know, get past a lot of their shortcomings on their, whether it's making stands, their properties, they're hunting, how they're setting up, whatever that may be just by playing one special sound, you know, that's, that's coming. I, yeah. So don't ask me that. It's not a, well, it's not a one size fit all, man. You know, like, no, I believe me, listen, I've been the guy who sat there looking at his, all his calls and being like, (laughs) all right, that's a snowshoe hair. There ain't, I, I, if I was a coyote, I wouldn't know what that sound would mean. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, it just doesn't matter. I think these coyotes don't know the difference between a snowshoe hare and, a, and an eastern cottontail. It, it's it's a sound that 100%. reacts. And so when I'm 
that I used to get stuck in that rut. I used to do my calls based on what animals. Were oh about. yeah. yeah. Trying to, trying to make, you know, make sure I'm doing everything I can. Hey, you've um, made the jump then you've made the jump yes. to the next tier. You're leveled up right there. I find the double. So, <laughs> so my brother, we called in a double on uh let's see. I think we did, we did a calf in distress or a, no, it was a fawn in distress mixed chased by a mat. Then we did magpie directly after that. And we had a double come in and you know, that was the first time I had ever even tried fawn in distress. And so like, it's just, it's, you know, I think the, so then I what, let me guess, last, did you use that? Like how many times more stands did you use that same scenario and nothing ever happened? <laughs> every set that was, but that was the only double we called it actually the only cops we called them. And so there, hey, there now we're right back to where we talked about, right? Like 100%. that sense scenario right there. It was early on in the stand, right? Yep. Could you have played freaking whatever in those dying same cricket? Pair, dying yeah. cricket, they would have come into it. You know? and, see what I'm saying? That's 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 where it's at right there. It's all about your spot. Hundred percent. And, and so I would like urge people that you know you, when you're when you're because I know exactly where those where those guys come from. It's like, hey, what call is working? I've tried everything. You know, and it, it, it all comes down to exactly what you're saying. You have to move. You have to keep moving. If nothing's coming in, don't just assume it's your call. You know, you have to really think about there may just not be a coyote here. And you're not, you may not even be doing anything wrong. But understanding that there isn't really a one sound fits all. You know, there's yeah. definitely certain times of the year, you know, that I've learned from you, which is, yeah, there's certain calls that are going to work better, you know, later in the year. You know, coyote vocals may work a little better. But at the end of the day, a hungry coyote's going to come into a call where their instincts say, I'm hungry. I hear something going. I'm going to I'm going to go check it out. And, you know, I hear you talk about it all the time. They're, they're also they're just they're going to come check it out. You know, they're they may not yep. even be coming in to kill something or eat something. They're just going to come check out what's going on. And um, so I, I definitely I, I hear what you know, when those guys say, hey, you know, what call is working? It it just doesn't matter. And I and coming from a you know, yeah. guy who's jumped out of his truck you know, two weeks ago and ripped a mouth call and a coyote that just saw me driving, you know, it doesn't matter. You just got to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah. So what, so the last time you're out hunting, what does, uh, what your, your stand, lay me out your stand on how it looked as far as how you ran the call, the sounds mm -hmm. that you kind of went through <laughs> volume, all that kind of stuff. So the last couple of times I've gone out, so I bounce around quite a bit. The last time, um, you know, it's on a BLM road that it, it sees a fair bit of traffic, you know, um, but with a guy who has time constraints, you know, it, it's, it's within, you know, an hour of me. So being able to go out there, um, uh, I've called in coyotes previous years on this road. Um, so you know, what's your mind, let's back up. What's your mindset when you're, when you're going into that road, what are you thinking? Okay. You're thinking you just kind of mentioned it, but that probably accessible to most hunters. So you're assuming yes. that somebody else has probably hunted this area yeah okay and, so you're already making that I'm assumption in, which is good i know this place probably has been called to if it hasn't been called to it's seen a lot of traffic whether it be just people driving around taking a stroll uh you know mountain bikers so i know that when i go into a place like this i'm gonna have to do a walk a little bit farther you know and so off this road so i'm willing to walk you know it's I don't mind walking and i don't mind carrying my stuff so i'll walk you know as far as it takes and so this one spot um, the first, the first, it's a lot of junipers. It's got some sage flats. Um, you know, there's a couple big bowls that it drops into sage flats, you know, and to me it's, I'm still at the point where I'm still looking at, like, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for. And I haven't called in enough coyotes in this specific area to really understand what they're doing. I'm looking yeah. at their foot traffic as they're coming in. So I know that they're not, you know, continuously, living in that sage flat or out there, you know, they're running that they're, they're actually running a lot closer to the roads in that area than what I'm used to, you know, what I would hope a coyote would do. And so as I'm going in and this is a couple of weeks ago. So, um, you know, I sit at the, in the tree line underneath a, a juniper tree and trying to get my wind. And, you know, the other thing I've been kind of messing around with is where I'm sitting in regards to what the wind is doing. There's so many times where I'm obsessed with trying to get the wind in my face you know, trying yeah. to position myself to be, okay, I got to be straight downwind from this thing because I, you know, I don't want a coyote coming around and me not seeing it. Um, you know, this particular day, it was just a weird, it kind of a, it was a, like an Easter, it was an Eastern wind. So I had to position myself a little bit towards more coming across, um, sage flat out in front of me, you know, I got, it's going, it's dropping down. So I got junipers up behind me and just trying to get a position to where I got enough to where I try and put myself in a position where nothing really is going to come behind. If I can, 
nothing's going to come behind because I go a lot by myself a lot. So I'm trying to eliminate oh, yeah. places that I'm trying, that I will have to look. Um, so I'm trying to box myself in. I had a little saddle off to my right to where, you know, if I'm an animal deer, coyote, whatever have you, that's going to be the travel lane is that, is that saddle. So I knew if I could get on the, you know, the left side of it, wind's coming this way, yeah, anything yeah. coming down to this call, hopefully I'm going to see it, you know? So I'm, and I sit down, you know, and the other thing I'm trying to kind of deal with too, is, you know, the distance of my call, where, where, how far away am I putting that thing? You know, when is it good to have it close to you? When is it good to get it out far? Um, you know, and it's like, I, I do a lot of what I do call wise, you know, based on what you're doing. So my first set, my first call is usually the prey, prey sound, whether, you know, whether it's a field mouse, I've been messing around with rodent calls, rodent sounds, uh, rabbit, whatever, but I try and do the, the three, three to four minute rule. If nothing shows up in three to four minutes, you know, I'm, 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 I'm moving on from it. If they're, I'm not going to switch to a, a pr another prey sound because, you know, it made so much sense to me to think, listen, if, if a coyote's not coming into a prey sound, a different prey sounds not going to trigger it. Yep. You know, and um, so that particular set, it was prey sound three to four minutes. I think I did like a, like a KG cottontail or something like that. Um, nothing came in. And then went straight into coyote vocals, mating sounds, you know, and then I always finish with the pup fights and, you know, pup distress, all so that you talk stuff. about coyote vocals. Are you saying you went into like actual howls? Uh, Sometimes. I mean, it depends. Like, I'll, like if I don't start with a prey distress, I'll start with a howl. And see, because I mean, last year I called in two coyotes just on a lone female howl. You know, again, they else. came in what in about two minutes, real quick, real quick. <laughs> and so it's it's like so. Like, there we go. Back there, could you play so, the rabbit? They might yeah, have come running they in. Might have. <laughs> and they're they're just so reactionary. And so yeah. it just depends. So like, if I start with a prey, I usually won't go to a howl. If I start with a prey sound, I'll go right into you know mating sounds or a coyote fight. Or so, something where just to try and trigger that aggressive coyote, you know, yeah, that yeah. you're talking about. Yep. And I'll usually go, you know, whether, and like I said, I still trying to figure out what I want to do with my calls, but sometimes I'll start with a pup distress and then go into coyote fights. Sometimes I'll start with a coyote fight or, or, or breeding pair or something like that. And then I'll go into pup distress. Um, and I've been kind of folks like, like we're getting later, we're getting later, later in the year. So I'm trying to, to focus more on, you know, coyote vocals as far as pairs breeding pairs you know pup distresses um but it's like i said it, it's it, it all comes down to where i'm at and out there you're playing that game of you're not going to be in the one percent club you're you're grinding for one out there where i'm at so yeah you know and i and and what my what i've been trying to do is also in between how far i go between my sets and so if i make a call you know nothing comes in i'm only going to go half mile three quarters of a mile just to try and like you said lay down as many as many sets as you can just to see what's going on when you're doing that when you're only going about a half mile in between how long are you sitting on stand for total so usually i like i mean just my ocd kicks in and i, <laughs> I have to sit so the first set i usually will go at least 20 minutes and if nothing comes in then I'll probably shorten them up as I go, maybe 15, 16 minutes as I go or less. You know, sometimes it's 10 to 12, you know, especially when I haven't called in anything, especially when, you know, am I seeing coyote, am I seeing sign, whatever. The, if I, it, like, if I've got coyotes coming in on my first set or second set, then I'll, 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 I usually lengthen them out a little bit more. But if I'm not seeing anything, they're quick call, they're quick sets, 15 minutes around is what I'd say, except for my first one. That's just, I don't know. It's like I said, my OCD, I really got to be thorough, you know, yeah, so yeah. I'll go my first one, usually around 20, 25 minutes, and then they'll go shorter as I go. So I'm kind of playing the devil's advocate here. Like of those stands when you're sitting there for 20 minutes, like, have you, I mean, and it sounds like, and let me get this right too, because every, this is the thing about time on stand is everybody's time on stand is completely different because yeah. the exact, the way that you play the call, some guys like to pause it you know, not how I do it. Some guys yep. will start off way, way low volume and it's not till halfway through the stand where they actually give it enough volume to reach where the coyotes are probably going to be at, you know, mm -hmm. so it differs, but you know, you just, let's just say 20, your 20 minute stands. I mean, mm -hmm. have you been, have you called in very many coyotes from the 15 to 20 minute mark compared to the zero to five minute mark? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I'm like, it's like I said, when you're not, a, when I'm not a veteran like you, yeah. Every coyote, to me, every coyote matters. So I'm going to be like, I, I will wait that, that 20 minutes, that 21 minutes for that <laughs> one. That's just sneaking in, you know? And it's, it's, so it's funny you say that. So <clears throat> that story with uh, me and my little brother, 
when that one came out of nowhere downwind. We had no idea what we were doing. We played uh, whatever, one of the rabbit sounds. We played that for 25 minutes straight. No, no breaks, no nothing. Just that 25 minute dying rabbit sound. And sure enough, that one came 15 yards straight front. What, so what, time of, what time of day was that? That was afternoon. That was actually, that was a little bit early afternoon as well. So yeah, I was wondering that, you know, was that coyote up on the move? You know, I was wondering this. Probably didn't take that coyote 25 minutes to get there. At least probability Absolutely. tells us that, right? I almost yep. want, I always picture those scenarios like, was this this picture of this coyote just out, just diddy bopping around? And then all of a sudden, at like 20 minutes, he just pops up over this little hill. And then all of a sudden, oh, here's the the rabbit. And I yeah. always wonder those stands because you hear it. I, I hear guys, oh man, I kill coyotes sitting there for 40 minutes. Well, obviously that differs on how you run the call and, and everything like that, you know, but it's, uh, it's always interesting to kind of, and that's the thing too, is like, visualize. you don't know, you don't know. It's no. like that coyote could have been just up and moving, you know, for as long as we sat there, that coyote could have been two miles away for all we know and just moving along. And all of a sudden here's my call. And that coyote may not have been within hearing, you know, range for the first 22 minutes. And then all of a sudden he's in, he's in range and then he starts hauling in. So it's, it's one of those things where you just, it, it's trial by error. And that's, that's where I'm at right now is, is still trying to keep track of what works, what doesn't, what time of day works, you know, where, where am I having my most success? Um, and to me, it's, it's, it's coming down to exactly what you talk about. It's coming down to how much ground are you covering and are you within their bubble? And, um, it's, it's, you know, being okay with walking out of a stand, even though I didn't put in my whatever 20 minutes, but walking out of there at a 12, 14 minutes and being like, okay, I'm, I'm okay. Let's move on. You know, because I used to, like I said, I used to think, oh, you just got to keep calling. Eventually they'll come in. And that's just not, that's just not the way of it. You know, especially. Yeah. And, could it happen? Yeah. It could happen. Right. Absolutely Probability tells us the, the, the largest percentage of coyotes are not, they're, they're, 100%. they're going to be there early on. Right. That's yeah. yeah. And and it's the, the most success I have is in that first three to four minutes, whether I start a prey sound, whether I start, you know, a howl, it doesn't matter. It's that first three to five minutes is where I have my most success just because you're getting the reaction. You're they're there, you're in their bubble and they're coming in. Those are my, you and the, every other coyote hunter out there. 100 percent. yeah absolutely so so that's what you know it comes down to styles really you know i mean there's i mean the way i talk and teach about coyote hunting is how i do it right i mean that doesn't yep. mean it's the best way or the only way um but for me and i don't i assume every coyote hunter is like this but for me i've always been about i want to kill as many possible coyotes as i can in the amount of time i have to kill coyotes Almost yep. like a contest mentality, right? Everybody, we talk about contests and everybody's like, what do you do different for con? No, nothing. I'm like, because this is my goal every time I go out, whether it's fun hunting with my boys or my buddy or my dad or clients or whatever, we're, I'm wanting to kill as many possible coyotes as we can. Absolutely. You know? so, so that's the style that I have, you know? So I guess for everybody else, I mean, hopefully, you know, whether that's your style or not, maybe, I mean, because it's hard. I mean, the way we hunt and the way we're talking about hunting right now is, is physically demanding. Like I, most guys that come hunting with me are like, damn, I've never hunted coyotes that hard, not even close to it in my entire life. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, it all falls down if that's, but you may not be that type of guy, right? You're like, nah, you know, I'm going to go take my time and I'm going to sit there for 40 minutes. Well, you know, think about maybe just analyze your, if you're going to sit on stand for 45 minutes, what you do on that 45 minutes, you know, how can you make that the most productive 45 minutes that you're going to make, you know, how, and if you're only going to sit there for six or eight minutes, how do we make it the most productive six or eight minutes, you know, uh, Absolutely. and have a plan after that, where we're going, what we're going to do next. Yeah. And I, you know, and it, it's like, it all depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to go out, you know, and you're not, truly going to go out and be you know addicted and obsessed with it like i am because like i said I, I get competitive with this stuff and so yeah. when i fail it's like the, the one thing i want to do is make sure i don't so it's oh, like yeah it's it's just my ocd my competitiveness like it's when i'm failing at something i'm going to continue to do it until i get it right <clears throat> you know but other it's it's one of those things too where guys aren't you know understanding how i think demanding physically but demanding mentally hunting predators is just in general i mean coyotes are are you know one thing but if you're just hunting predators in general it's a whole different ball game i mean everything you're taught about you know deer hunting and elk hunting it's it, it does not it, it does not make sense 
whatsoever because these animals you're hunting animals that have better senses i mean incredible vision everything's built to be a predator versus you're hunting a prey animal you know you're going to know okay hey i know what these deer do i know what these elk do but when you're hunting predators i mean it's a whole different ball game and so it all depends on what you're doing you know if you're a guy that goes out and enjoys just being outside and hey i got no problem sitting on a stand for 40 minutes you know it's it's just all based on what you're able to do you know and how much time you have that's why i tell the anti-hunters when they start bashing us about using ars and i said man these things are tough we need every advantage i can get i need a badass e-caller with these unbelievable sounds i need an ar-15 with 20 round mag suppressor big scopes you name it i need it all man Absolutely. I, I, I'm willing at this point, I'm like, man, I'm going to buy a ghillie suit. I, you know, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go all in on this here because it, it, it truly is. It's, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, man. It's challenging. And there's, you, you really just never stop learning and it's only going to help you, you know, even if you're a guy that's not going into coyote hunting to be a coyote hunter, you know, it's going to help you at, you know, be a better hunter, you know, especially it, it's just one of those things where it's going to transfer and it's going to help you become a better hunter. And, you know, especially when you're like me, when you don't, you only get to go on one good hunt a year for, you know, deer or elk, this allows me that ability to, to still keep my skills, like hone my skills, shooting. Is just, I mean, forget about the hunting aspect and, and hiking around. I mean, just shooting a coyote oh, it, yeah. it is incredibly challenging. The whole podcast I mean, on that. I, absolutely. I mean, you, I mean, you watch some of the shots you make on those coyotes running at, you know, 150 yards, 200 yards. You're like, man, alive. What's this guy? What's this guy doing? You know, you know it's, uh, it's 10, like 10,000 uh, rep adage right there. You know, yeah. <laughs> if you shoot at 10,000 running coyotes in your lifetime, you might be good at it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, but, but I mean, that's why I got into it is because it helps you hone your skills. It's fun. It's challenging. You constantly are learning about what's going on out there, the ecosystem in general. You know, you're, you're, you, I mean, you're learning about deer. I mean, you see deer. I mean, I, at least where I'm at, I'm seeing what deer are doing at this time of the year, you know? So it's just all, it's, it's an all, in, it's an all thing that you can do, you know, to sharpen your shooting skills, sharpen your hunting skills. And it's awesome to bring, like, if you're trying to get your kids into it, this is, I mean, you're not really going to find a better activity. Oh, hundred percent. Any, uh, you got like bucket list predator hunt, any states you'd like to go hit? Man, up I, in the future, when I have the time, I plan on I, I'd like to take a full like September, October, all the way till like December. If I could if I could convince my wife to hop in like an RV with me. I'd be oh, like, yeah. I want to do all the Western states here. And I and I'm just I, I want to just coyote hunt for like two months. Just give me like oh, two yeah. or three months of coyote hunting and let me travel around now all the way down to Arizona, up to Wyoming. <clears throat> let me get it out of my system. So, I mean, eventually, yes. I, I mean, eventually, I'd, I want to get out hunting with you at some point. You know, um, I'd like to go down to Arizona and do all this stuff because um, all I've ever done is the Oregon Coyote. And, yeah. you know, they're, it's, it's awesome. It's fun. But, I mean, seeing what you guys do and where you guys go, and it, it's just – it's something that's – it's on my bucket list to go to Arizona, number one, and Wyoming, and Nebraska. Well, they're easier to hunt in a state that you don't normally hunt. I can tell you that's like the normal adage. Everybody, that's the, uh, it's normally what everybody says. Oh, you must be easy to kill them where you're at. They're tough where I'm at. Yeah, that's way easy out here. Come on out. Well, I'll tell you this. After what I've been dealing with up here, if I could take a trip to Arizona, worse. it can't, it can't get much worse. You know, <laughs> I, I tell you this, if I could go to Arizona tomorrow and, and coyote hunt, I'd be like, holy cow, finally. Hey, and if it, Anthony's but, killing him with a shotgun down there, you, hell, it's got to be easy, right? Yeah, my worst fear, though, would be me go down there and get and, and get absolutely blank all the way through. I'd be like, <laughs> all right, well, I might sell my AR, sell my collar. Just, uh, I'm going to move on. I'm just not meant to shoot coyotes. Oh, heck. Well, yeah, hopefully one of these. You know what I'd like to do sometime? We should we should look at filming a last stand MLB edition, right? Bring it on, man. I got, Let's do it. Look, Bryce Elder, so, he's all about it. He shoots coyotes down in Texas, you know absolutely we should that'd we be, should we should do it and i could talk shit awesome. to you guys I mean, the whole got, time about but, missing coyotes and watch you get all pissed off it'd be fun i can't <laughs> wait i can't wait what i can't wait for is you're not you're, you know you're not going to hear from me is you're not going to hear a word when i miss one and you drop it all you're going to get from me is a high five and be like that's what i'm talking about <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but absolutely that'd be awesome heck yeah <laughs> well buddy i appreciate you coming on man no I, I appreciate you having me this has been a lot of fun and it's like I said, getting talked to a guy who does it, 
all the time like you do and is very successful at it. Uh, it's, it's cool for me. So, um, yeah, man, thank you for having me. Well, we'll be watching. Good luck with your upcoming season. Hoping yeah. for what? 30, 40 dingers. No, I'm going to, I'm going to try, man. Yeah. I'm going to try. I'm going to try and get something consistent going and run with it. It's got to be. So what's, what's that equivalent to that? Like, like smashing a home run. It's got to be like, what, like a solo triple. So even a solo double, what's it comparable to, huh? Somewhere in there. So smashing a home run, it, it, it probably be, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's either a triple or it's, or it's calling in one shoot or it's calling in a double shooting a double with a suppressor and then having another one chase in after it. That, that might be the comparison. I'll start using that analogy when we're filming. Uh, just got no, us a dinger. Dinger. That, that's, that's it right there. Let's go. <laughs> hey, how you've got an Instagram profile, don't you? You guys want to follow yeah. along? I know you post some, most of probably, if, you know, Bryce was on the last podcast. He says he kind of keeps his Instagram for like baseball stuff. Cause a lot of, you know, that's where most of his followers, but do you, you post a little bit of everything on yours look like. Yeah, man. I try yeah. to do, I try and do it all. You know, I try and I'm trying to get, and I'm terrible with social media as well. So like trying to get better at just kind of getting a, a better idea of what, you know, I do on a daily basis, you know, what my days look like trying to involve people and, um, you know, my hobbies, whether it be fishing, hunting, you know, lifting, whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to get a little bit better at that because I'm, I'm terrible with social media. I, I, I'm the same way. It's like, it's what we do all the time, whether I'm posting coyote stuff, it's kind of like just normal for us. Right. And it's like, why do people want to know about that? You know, like, yeah, that's no. just what I do. All, but then you're like, Oh, that's what they really want to know about is like, what, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm catching myself walking around in Oregon. I'm like, man, that would have been a good post, but that's just something I do every day. So, yeah. it's like, but I guess people want to see it. So I yeah, so. I got to get better at it, man. I got to get the age, better the age we live in, you know? Hundred percent, man. What's your Instagram at? At Seth Brown, just at yeah, Seth Brown, or you? Got... No, it's uh underscore. It's Mr. Brown underscore eleven. Underscore eleven. All right. Yeah, let me double check that. Like I said, I'm terrible at it. Yeah, I think that's so, that Mr. Sounds about so right. it's Mr. It's Mr. Underscore Brown eleven. Gotcha. I'm probably gonna. Well, have sounds to good, it. man. So we'll, we'll be following. We don't. We don't yeah. get very many A's. We don't get very many A's games on tv out here in nebraska it's not the uh, local uh whatever you call it the regional games that we get usually but hey i'll tell you what hey it's like i said if you want to bring out the family to any game this summer like let me know and get your tickets no problem come on out enjoy the game oh, yeah. get your on field bp and let's let's do it that'd be awesome especially when you come to vegas that sounds a little more fun at some point yeah maybe. here yeah here supposedly here in 2020 2000 i think stadium opens 2028 so we got a couple of years to go but I think that is going to be the move. We'll see. And uh, yeah, man, it'd be awesome. Heck yeah. That would be fun. Well, guys, appreciate you guys listening to another episode here. Eastman's Predator Pros. Um, you know, if you're looking for any more information on myself, you can go to my Instagram page, which is just at Jeff Nimnick. Um, that's G-E-O-F-F. -F. Um, you can go to my website, which is coyotecraze.com. That'll get you links to the last end episodes we've been talking about. Um, links to information on the coyote schools that I do. Um, also got some cool stuff coming up in the future that we'll be we'll be launching on there as well. So stay tuned for that. But obviously, we got to thank the sponsors. Can't do this without them. Six Hour Optics, Swagger Bipods, Hornady, Lucky Duck Predator Calls, Silencer Central, Cryptech, Onyx Hunt, and of course, Eastman's for bringing this all to you guys. Head on over to their website, which is eastmans.com. Check out all they have going on on there. But Seth, once again, appreciate you coming on, buddy. Awesome, man. Season. Thanks for having me. Appreciate and thanks it. to you guys for watching, and we will catch you next time right here on Eastman's Predator Pros Podcast.